Hi guys, so today we're going to be talking about how to make a resume that is organized, neat, and hopefully impressive. We'll start by reading this quote from Oprah Winfrey. She said, The challenge of life I have found is to build a resume that doesn't simply tell a story about what you want to be, but it's a story about who you want to be. This presentation is brought to you today by your Career Services Department. If you've never heard of us before, we wanted to let you know about who we are and what we do. We can help you with your resumes, cover letters, interview skills, job search strategy, the list goes on. Our motto, however, is all stuff is career stuff. Your career touches almost every aspect of your life, and we're here to support you through the obstacles, challenges, or exciting steps that happen along the way. So the overall purpose of this workshop is to give you knowledge so that you can ultimately create your own resume. Unfortunately, I wish we did, but we don't have the power to actually get you the job. But what we can do is help you take the steps to make you a really strong candidate. This includes formatting a resume that is consistent and easy to read, shares strong stories with numbers, and understanding the employer point of view to know what they are experiencing on their end. To understand how to create a resume that will satisfy employers, it's important to understand the basic employer process and what they are experiencing first. I'll give you a few seconds to guess your answer to each question. For every job that's posted online, how many resumes on average do you think an employer is receiving? About 200 plus resumes. Now, how long do you think an employer takes, on average, to review those resumes? Six to eight seconds. Lastly, out of those 200 original applicants, how many people do you think, on average, make it to the interviewing stage? about five candidates. So what does this tell you about resumes? It's really only a small part of your job application process, but it's one of the most important steps. It's the employer's first impression of you and who you are. Also, with the quantity of applicants per job posting and the short amount of time the employer takes to review it, your resume really has to get some important information across pretty quickly. What is the purpose of a resume? To get an interview. More times than not, that is the one and only goal of a resume. So let's be real. We know that this process isn't always fun or fair. So we wanted to share a little bit about our perspective. You might find that articles tell you different things, or you might find that articles are telling you that every resume should align exactly with the job description that you're applying for. We understand that this can be confusing and way too much work for anybody to reasonably do if you're applying to a bunch of positions at the same time. Also, employers are using applicant tracking systems. This is different types of software that digs through your resumes looking for specific requirements and keywords. This means that computers are reading your resume before an actual human being. We also know that employers hold too much power in the process. The whole process is designed to make their lives more simple which is frustrating to you as the job seeker. Here's our advice to counter some of the frustrations with resume writing. First, have a master resume. This is a list of everything you have ever done and a description of each. You probably won't use this to apply to anything, but it captures your professional story and allows you to copy and paste relevant items into future resumes. Next, follow the 80-20 rule. This means that you should keep about 80% of the information the same on your resume and modify about 20% based on the industry you are interested in. We suggest reviewing multiple job descriptions for common keywords and then plugging those into your resume. Last, we recommend having two or more resumes if you are applying to multiple industries. For example, 
if you are applying to a retail position and an office administration position, you will probably want to highlight two different skill sets and different experiences. This means you can save one office resume and one retail resume. You should only use this method if you have enough experience and transferable skills to do so. So guess what? There is no right way to write a resume. I know what you're thinking, then why would I listen to this presentation? The truth is that you'll hear many different approaches and there's no one right way to write a resume. But whatever format you choose, the key is being consistent in your choices. Resumes will bend and evolve and change over time depending on a lot of different factors. However, there are some common guidelines and advice that we can give you that will hopefully make your resume stand out to employers. So let's play a game. A statement is going to pop up on your screen about resumes. I'll give you a few seconds to decide if you think this statement is true or false. If it's true, this happy hamster will pop up. If it's false, this angry otter will appear. Ready? Great. My resume should include my high school diploma. This is false. You do not need to include your high school diploma if you are actively pursuing higher education. My resume should be 100% honest. This is true. There's a difference between making things sound fancy and professional and straight up lying. Let's use an example. Sally put Microsoft Excel as one of her greatest skills on her resume, even though she has no idea how to use it. When she arrived at her interview, they asked her to sit down and create pivot tables using three pages of data. Awkward. Being honest on your resume can get you out of some sticky situations. My resume should include a headshot or photo of myself. This is false. Some people or articles might tell you that a headshot or photo of yourself will help you stand out on a resume. However, it's absolutely not necessary to include one unless you are going for an acting or modeling position. Even then, you would probably include some type of separate portfolio. Having a headshot or photo may also open up the door for bias. Unfortunately, there are a million biases that exist and you want to eliminate as much bias as you can from the hiring process. My resume should include my full street address. This is also false. When you put your exact street address, you are allowing the employer to plug your address into Google Maps and know exactly how long it might take you to commute there. This can work for or against you. Say you're willing to commute 45 minutes, but the employer eliminates you because they fear that you'll be consistently late. Your resume might get tossed aside. Your city, state, and zip code are all that's needed until you're signing the paperwork at your new job. My resume should include my social security number and birthday. No, the employer does not need to know any of this information about you in the beginning stages of your job search. Resumes might be printed out and lost in the office somewhere. You don't want all of your personal information in a vulnerable situation. My resume is going to be awesome. Yes, we have full faith that you are going to create a resume that highlights your unique skills and stands out to employers. Some people might tell you that making your resume visually fancy, adding colors and pictures and graphics will make you stand out. But we disagree. Your ability to make a resume pop is not your product. A resume is your professional story. And just like a book, the pages may look the same, but the content is what makes it stand out. And that is the product. Content matters. However, 
you wouldn't publish a book that is messy or hard to read. You still have to make the formatting professional and organized. Being able to format your resume in a way that is consistent and easy to read will actually showcase skills such as organization and attention to detail. If you use platforms with resume templates such as Microsoft Word or Google Docs, you might see these types of formatting. They look nice, right? But they aren't the most effective. These graphics might not make it through applicant tracking software. The images and tables might throw the system off, which will result in it not picking up on the text that it's looking for. There is also so much space being taken up by the graphics that can be filled with more critical information about your skills and experiences. Although you may be tempted to make it pretty, a classic black and white resume is typically the safest way to go. The way you organize your resume will tell a story within a story. We'll go into more detail about this, but the way you group and order your information will all make a difference in what story you are trying to tell. So now let's talk about the different sections of a resume. We'll start with the resume heading. It should be noted that although we are listing these different sections in a particular order, there's no right or wrong order. It will change depending on your current goals or intentions and what you want to highlight first. Here we have your heading. This is where you include basic information about yourself so the employer can reach you. Here's an example of Jake Smith's resume. Let's go through what he included here. He has his name, which is bold and in large font at the top of the page. He has his location, his city, state, and zip code. He has his phone number and his email. Notice that Jake's email is just his name and a number. It isn't anything crazy like cool guy 67 or I love pizza 49. You want your email to be simple and professional so that you can make a good first impression on the employer. Throughout this presentation, we will be building Jake's resume. After we go through each section, you will see it added to the resume until we have a final product at the end. This is so you can get insight into the full picture of what a resume might look like step by step. Jake's got his heading done. So far, so good. Now let's move on to the education section. As you can see, Jake is attending HCCC and wanted to include that on his resume. Let's see all the details that he added here. He has his section header, which simply describes what kind of information is below. He has his exact kind of degree he is pursuing, AS in Human Services slash Pre-Social Work. Notice that he does not put major in Human Services. He mentions exactly what kind of degree he is going for. He has the school that he's attending written out fully. Hudson County Community College, not abbreviated to HCCC. He also puts the location of the school. Jake put the date that he is expecting to graduate. It is okay to guess if you don't know exactly. The employer is more interested in knowing when you are planning on having that degree in your hand than when you started pursuing your degree. Here is other information that you can include in your education section. A minor that you are pursuing. Relevant coursework may be a good idea to include if you do not have a lot of experience in that field. This way, you can still let the reader know that you have knowledge of that field. You can include your GPA. Generally, you only want to include your GPA if it is a 3.0 or higher. It is optional to include, but might be a good idea for internships, scholarships, or other academic-based opportunities. You may also choose to include any awards or honors under your education section. Accomplishments is also optional to include in your education section. Here's an example of what this additional information can look like. This person decided to include their GPA, the honor of being on the Dean's List, a scholarship they received, and an award they were given. They also chose to include their relevant coursework. 
So here's Jake's resume with his completed heading and education section. As you can see, Jake chose to add relevant coursework to show his knowledge of the field. Let's move on to the experience section of a resume. The experience section is really the heart of your resume where you will begin talking in detail about your accomplishments and skills. This is Jake's experience section. Let's take a look at what he included. First, we have his section heading. This can be labeled work experience, professional experience, internship experience, volunteer experience, whatever you think is the most accurate representation of your specific experience you are including. Next, he put his position. As you can see, Jake is currently working as a classroom assistant. On the next line, Jake put the company or organization he worked for and where it's located. Not the exact street address, but the city and the state. So, as we can see, Jake is working for Kids Daycare in Westfield, New Jersey. He also put the dates on the right-hand side of the page, which makes them easy to find. As we can see, Jake began working at Kids Daycare in January 2018 and is still presently employed there. You'll notice that Jake also included specific numbers and achievements within his bulleted descriptions of his experiences. Details like this really show the scope or amount of work that you're doing and how much of an impact you had on the company. In this bullet, Jake explains how the orientation night he ran was for 50 plus parents and the fact that it received 95% positive feedback. This provides me with a lot more detail than a simple ran an orientation night. I now understand how many people were there, how much work went into it, and the fact that he was successful in running it. You want about three to five bullets for each position listed. Any less might make it look like you didn't do much. Any more will run the risk of losing focus or taking up too much space. You want to lead each sentence with an action verb. You don't want to use I statements such as I developed blah blah blah. In a bit, we'll go over some strong action verbs to use throughout your resume. You also want your dates to be in reverse chronological order. This means I want to put the most recent thing I've done first and work my way down to the most previous thing I've done. Notice that Jake is writing out whole names of the month. You can choose to do this or put numbers, but whatever you choose to do, just make sure it is consistent throughout your resume. Instead of just listing tasks in your experience section, you want to try to include accomplishment statements that will show the value you added or continue to add to companies you are working or have worked for. These statements include context, skills, and outcomes with numbers when possible to prove your talent, not just state it. You always want to start your bullets with an action verb. Sometimes it's hard to think of unique, strong action verbs for each bullet that you're writing. Here we'll go over some different accomplishments you may have had at your current or previous positions and action verbs that go with each. As I'm going through the list, try to ask yourself if any of these accomplishments apply to you. It's important to keep in mind that you should use present tense if you are currently working somewhere and past tense if you are no longer working there. Let's get into different action verbs that you can use in your resume. You led a project. Produced, oversaw, headed, organized. You saved a company time or money. Conserved, reduced, decreased, deducted. You increased efficiency, sales, revenue, or customer satisfaction. Advanced, accelerated, improved, boosted. You changed or improved something. Redesigned, influenced, updated, transformed. You managed a team. Directed, guided, supervised, trained. You brought in partners, funding, or resources. 
acquired, negotiated, partnered, secured. You supported customers, advised, coached, consulted, informed. You were a research machine, analyzed, assessed, investigated, tracked. You wrote or communicated, authored, composed, documented, corresponded. You oversaw or regulated, authorized, delegated, enforced, transformed. You achieved something, exceeded, awarded, surpassed, outperformed. Now we're going to talk about action result statements. The framework of action result statements can help ensure that you are not only discussing what you did and how you did it, but the result that came from your action. This involves two parts, what you did, your intervention that showcases your skills, and the impact of your behavior. This applies to resume writing, but let's bring it into an everyday situation so that we can get a clearer understanding of this framework. Every day, I brush my teeth. That's my action. That's what I do. Let's add a little more detail in there. What do I use to brush my teeth? Well, I use an electric toothbrush and Colgate whitening toothpaste. How often do I brush my teeth? I brush my teeth twice a day for two minutes. Now, what's the impact of me doing this? I'm preventing cavities and thus saving myself some money that would be used on dental work. Let's put all of that information into an action result statement. Brush teeth using electric toothbrush and Colgate whitening toothpaste for two minutes twice a day resulting in a decrease of money spent on dental bills. Okay, now let's do this with an item that might actually go on your resume. First, let's start with an example of a task that you might do at work. Maintain medical records, technical library, or correspondence files. This might tell me what you do, but it doesn't give me a lot of detail about how you do it or what impact it has. To get some of that detail, now ask yourself, what did I do? Well, I didn't just maintain medical records, I actually initiated a new filing system. How did I do it? I used the patient's last names and date of birth to organize everything. How much, how many, or how often. I did this for 300 plus patient files. That's a lot more work than if our office only had 50 patients. And what was the impact? Me initiating this new system actually resulted in more efficient record keeping, expedient file retrieval, and lower wait times for patients. You may not be able to answer all of these questions for every single one of your bullets. However, this is a really helpful process that might force you to pull more detail out of different tasks that you might be doing at work. Your action and result can be flipped and still get the same message across. It just matters that you have both and not one without the other. For example, I can say initiated a new filing system for 300 plus patients using last names and date of birth, which resulted in more efficient record keeping expedient file retrieval, and lower wait times. In this example, my action is highlighted in blue text and comes first before my result. My result is highlighted in yellow text and comes after the action. I can also flip this statement and say, increased efficiency of record keeping, expedited file retrieval, and reduced wait times by initiating a new filing system for 300 plus patients using last names and date of birth. In this example, my result comes first, followed by my action. Both of these bullets are getting the same message across. 
you have some flexibility in the way you want to organize and word your bullets. There's an unfair assumption that if your experience was not in the United States, it doesn't count on your resume. Don't let anyone tell you that your experience from your home country doesn't count. If you're from another country or lived in another country for a period of time, your experience is still 100% valid and should absolutely be included on your resume to showcase your skills. Jake is continuing to build out his resume. So far, he has his heading, education, work experience, and volunteer experience listed. Now let's move on to the skills section of your resume. Skills sections talk about relevant abilities that highlight your qualifications for the job and differentiate you from other candidates. Skills sections are helpful when your employment history doesn't capture these details. It should be easy to read, and the reader should be able to quickly understand what you are good at. You always want to include other languages you may speak. You don't have to include English if your resume is written in English. You also want to make sure to include your level of fluency in relation to these languages. For example, basic, intermediate, proficient, enough to pass by in a work environment, or fluent. You want to include hard or technical and software skills that you may have. These can be general or more specific. For example, I can mention spreadsheets or more specifically Microsoft Excel. I can mention accounting software or QuickBooks. Maybe I want to say that I'm good at digital marketing or maybe I want to mention a program that I feel comfortable using such as Canva. Computer programming or a specific language such as C++, IT troubleshooting or diagnostics, graphic design or Adobe Photoshop, data analysis or SPSS, cybersecurity or data encryption. Again, the amount of detail you include depends on what story you are trying to tell. You can see here that Jake now added his skills section to the bottom of his resume. He decided to include Microsoft Office, QuickBooks, the fact that he is fluent in Spanish, and Canva. Now let's move on to the certification or license section of your resume. Your certification and licenses section should include credentials in your field of interest. You want to include the title of your license or certificate, your license or certificate number, the licensing organization that you received it from and the city and state where it's located, and the date issued or expiration date. On the right hand side of your screen, you'll see that we included three separate examples. You can see that the first example has the name of the certificate, the certificate number, the entity they received it from, and the expiration date all on the same line. The second example has the name of the entity they received it from, the location, and the date received on the same line, but the name of the certificate is on a separate line underneath. The third example has the name of the certificate or license and the number on the same line, but the entity they received it from and the location are on a separate line. This is really to showcase that there is no right way to format this information. These are all acceptable. The most important thing is that the information is consistent and easy to read. All right, Jake has now added his adult CPR and AED certificate that was issued to him by EMS Safety at the bottom of his resume. Moving on to the leadership section of your resume. Your leadership section should include any opportunity that you participate in that demonstrates initiative and doing more than just school. This can include clubs, an honor society, student government, case competition, projects, committees, or any scholarships that you may have received. You want to include the name of the engagement, 
the role that you have in dates. We've included three different examples on the right hand side of your screen. Again, you can see that all of these leadership experiences are formatted in three different ways. The first example includes the name of the organization, the role they have, and the dates on the same line. They do not go into more detail about what they do there. The second example includes the leadership experience underneath their education section. This is a good example of combining information when appropriate. As you can see, this person was involved in the Goldman Sachs Local College Collaborative and felt that this experience was important or relevant enough to explain it in detail. They may be applying for a business opportunity, then this experience would be directly related. The third example also shows the leadership experience under the education section. But instead of writing a full paragraph, this person decided to list small bullets underneath each. Again, the formatting is different, but all of these examples are including information in a way that tells the unique story that they are trying to get across. It is consistent and easy to read. Now let's move on to the awards and honors section of your resume. Your awards and honors section should include anything that formally signifies your achievement. This includes scholarships, dean's list, distinction or GPA, awards, and fellowships. You should include the name of the engagement, your role, and dates. On the right side of your screen, we've included three examples that are all formatted differently. In the first example, this individual decided to include his or her awards and honors under their education section. They included their GPA. The general rule of thumb when it comes to listing your GPA, again, is to include it if it is a 3.0 or higher. This person also included the fact that they have made the Dean's List every semester since spring 2018. The second person has a similar format and decided to include their awards and honors under their education section as well. The third person decided that they wanted to dedicate a separate section to their awards and honors. They also felt that they wanted to explain what the award was. The person explains that they are a fellow with America Needs You. Most readers will know what GPA or Dean's List is, but they may not know the specific programs or awards. This person does a good job at explaining what the program is and their involvement in it. This allows the reader to have more of an insight into what this honor really entails. A good idea is to save your certificates from any awards or honors you receive. That way you will have the information on hand when you're ready to include them in your resume. All right, so here's Jake's completed resume. We made it. It ends with his honors and awards section. Reminder that this is not the only way to format a resume. This is just one example. But as you can see, Jake made sure that his resume is neat, professional, consistent, and easy to read. So how do you decide what order your section should be in? The answer isn't so simple because it might change depending on what you're applying for and what information is the most relevant. Just make sure that you're prioritizing important information at the top of the page, that you're being strategic in what sections you choose, and that you know when to separate and when to combine information. So let's go through two examples using Jake's resume. In this example, Jake is applying to a human services internship. Jake put his education section at the top because he is actively pursuing his human services degree. He also included his relevant coursework because this shows that he has knowledge of the field. He moved his leadership section up because it shows that he is committed to his schoolwork and he's passionate about his degree. In this next example, we're going into the future and Jake is applying to a social work job. He graduated with his master's degree a few years ago. 
Jake has moved his education section towards the bottom because he wants to prioritize his professional work experience first. He's gotten rid of his sections such as relevant coursework because it's no longer necessarily needed. He emphasizes different leadership experiences and skills that are relevant to his field. As you can see, the order of your sections might be changed around in order to cater to the position you are applying to and what professional experience you gain along the way. Remember earlier in the presentation when we talked about the importance of formatting your resume? Fitting everything onto one page in a neat and organized way may be a bit difficult when you have a lot of information to include. However, you also don't want your resume to look blank and empty if you don't have much experience. We'll go through some general advice that may be helpful when formatting your resume. To begin with, as we've said throughout this presentation, there is no right way to format your resume. There are a lot of different stylistic choices that you can make, but the key is to remain consistent in your choices. First, you want to choose a font that is simple and easy to read. You want to choose something like these fonts listed here. These aren't the only choices, but you want to make sure that they appear professional and neat. Next, you want to keep your font size between an 11 and 12, and your headings can be a 14 plus. You don't want to go smaller than an 11, because the reader will then struggle to read your content and may become too frustrated to complete reading your resume. Anything bigger than a 12, with the exception of section headings and your name, will appear too big and can be off-putting. The section headings can be larger than the text underneath, but it doesn't have to be. Your name, though, should typically be the biggest font on the page in order to stand out to the reader. You want to make sure that you are using different typographical emphasis, italics, bold, and regular font, throughout your resume in order to organize your information. We will go into more detail about how to do this on the next slide. When it comes to capitalization, make sure that you are capitalizing your words correctly. When in doubt, Google it. Beyond that, if you choose to make one section heading uppercase, just make sure that the rest are also uppercase. Again, consistency is key. Next, margins. Why would you want to change the margins on your page? Margins will allow you to fit more or less text on the page. So, if you have a lot to write, I may want to make my margins smaller so that I can fit more text. If I don't have a lot to write, I may want to make my margins bigger so that my resume appears more full. This is an example from Jake's resume. Here, we can see that Jake is using typographical emphasis to tell a certain story in an organized way. All of the what's on his resume are italicized. What degree, what position. All of the where's on his resume are bold and then regular font. Where he got his degree, where he worked. All of the whens on his resume are aligned to the right and normal font. When he graduated, when he started, and when he ended his work experience. All of these choices are consistent and the text is organized in a way that makes it easy to pick up on critical information quickly. If you've never edited your margins, here's a quick little tutorial on how to do so using Google Docs and Microsoft Word. If you're using Google Docs, you want to first click on the File button in the top left corner as shown. Then on that drop down list, choose Page Setup. After this, the Page Setup box will appear where you'll have the option to change the size of your margins. If you're using Microsoft Word, first click the Layout tab. From here, you will see options to change your margins to preset sizes. You can also click Custom Margins if you want to edit the sizes manually. Last but not least, this is an important step in the resume process that's often overlooked, naming your saved file. 
When you are saving your resume, you want to make sure that you are naming the file some variation of your name, resume, and the year. Not res, resi, 2019, doc1, chris2019, or blah. The employers will see the name of the file, and they want it to be easy to locate for later reference. Well, that's it. You've made it to the end of the presentation. Hopefully this workshop taught you about how to make a professional resume that stands out to employers. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or need any assistance writing or editing your resume or with any other career-related needs, please reach out to us. We are always here to help.